When you hear about someone serving a life sentence, you probably imagine that they committed a very serious crime in order to land themselves behind bars for so long. Often, that's true. In the video today, however, the offenses that resulted in life sentences are difficult to believe because they seem far-fetched or trivial. So yes, we're looking at 10 cases where the punishment, a life sentence, far exceeded the crime. Number 10. Writing a poem while wielding a sword can result in a life sentence, so apparently can wielding a pen. In 2012, after a secret trial, Muhammad al-Ajami, also known as Muhammad ibn al-Dib, a Qatari poet, was sentenced to life in prison for allegedly insulting Qatar's emir and encouraging the overthrow of Qatar's government by writing a poem. It isn't totally clear which of Ajami's poems landed him behind bars. The case was said to be based on a 2010 poem criticizing the former emir, though activists say Tunisian Jasmine, which was published in 2011, was the main impetus for the charges. In the poem, Ajami expressed support for the uprising in Tunisia, stating, We are all Tunis in the face of the repressive elite, and denounced all Arab leaders as thieves. After a 2013 appeal, Ajami's sentence was reduced to 15 years. After serving more than four years in prison, including a year in solitary confinement, Ajami was released after receiving a pardon from the emir. Number 9. Mailing some LSD Timothy Tyler was just 24 when he pled guilty to LSD distribution in 1994, a conviction which resulted in not one, but two life sentences without any possibility of parole. Tyler, a deadhead with a history of mental health issues, had two previous convictions on LSD possession when he was busted for mailing LSD to a friend who turned out to be a confidential informant for the DEA. Because the weight of the paper the LSD was on was included in the amount of drugs Tyler was charged with distributing, Tyler's guilty plea triggered two mandatory life sentences. In 2016, after serving more than 20 years of his sentences, Tyler was granted clemency by President Obama. Number 8. Stealing a pair of socks Curtis Wilkerson had a rough childhood growing up with a drug-addicted single mum. When Wilkerson was 16, his mother died and he fell in with a rough crowd, serving as a lookout in a string of robberies. He was caught, convicted, and he served six years in prison. When he got out, he turned his life around and spent the rest of his 20s and 30s avoiding trouble. That all changed one day in 1994 when, while killing time at the mall waiting for his girlfriend, he slipped a pair of plain white tube socks into a bag at a Mervyn's department store. Security guard Barnes apprehended him as he left the store, and they debated calling the police. Ultimately, they called the cops, and this forever changed Wilkerson's life. Wilkerson was convicted of shoplifting, and because of his two 1981 convictions, this was considered his third strike, triggering a sentence of 25 years to life. In an interview from prison, Wilkerson expressed his shock at the socks he swipes, leading to him spending the rest of his life behind bars. Number 7. Stealing Videos from Kmart Leandro Andrade was an army veteran and father of three when he was caught swiping children's videos from two different Kmarts in 1995. Normally such a theft, nine videos with a retail value of about $150, would be classified as petty theft, a misdemeanor punishable by a fine or six months or less in jail. However, because Andrade had a rap sheet that included a string of residential burglaries ten years earlier, during which Andrade was unarmed and no one was at home at the burglarized houses, Andrade was charged with two counts because the thefts had taken place at two different Kmarts of petty theft, with a prior being a felony. When he was convicted of the charges under California's three strikes law, he received a mandatory sentence of 25 years to life for each of the two charges. Andrade's lawyer argued that this sentence was cruel and unusual punishment. The case ultimately went to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ruled that because Andrade will eventually be eligible for parole at age 87, the sentence was not unduly harsh. Number 6. Treating Chronic Pain when you picture a drug trafficker, an Ivy League-educated middle-aged man in a wheelchair is probably not the first image that comes to mind. Nevertheless, 45-year-old Richard Pei, who suffers from multiple sclerosis and chronic pain from injuries sustained in a serious car accident in his 20s, was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years in prison for possessing Percocets and other pain pills weighing only 28 grams. This amount of pain medication was sufficient to classify him as a drug trafficker under Florida law, despite the fact that the police who had placed him under surveillance could points to no evidence that he'd sold or attempted to sell any of the pain medication in his possession. Initially, Pei's doctor, who had agreed to continue prescribing to Pei, sending prescriptions by mail when he moved from New Jersey to Florida, backed up Pei's story in interviews with the DEA, and he verified Pei's prescriptions when pharmacists checked them. However, when authorities began treating the doctor as a suspect, he then claimed some of the prescriptions were forgeries. Pei refused a plea deal, both because he maintained his innocence, but also because he feared a drug conviction 
infection would make it impossible for him to get the pain medication that he needed to lead a normal life. Ironically, Pei received higher dose pain treatment in prison via a morphine pump that was paid for by the state than the level of pain medication he was convicted of possessing on the outside. After serving nearly four years in prison and after intense media scrutiny, Pei was pardoned by Governor Charlie Crist and his Florida cabinet. Number 5. Burglarizing Your Own Home to Save Your Mother's Life Lance Saltzman had a difficult childhood. After being mauled by a pit bull when he was 17 months old, Saltzman struggled with cognitive deficits resulting from the attack. As a teen, Saltzman developed a serious drug problem, dropped out of high school, and was convicted of a series of misdemeanor offenses. Saltzman lived at home where his mother and his stepfather had a volatile relationship. In March of 2006, when Saltzman was 21 years old, his stepfather pointed a gun near his mother during a heated argument and fired it. Police were called and took the gun, but returned it to his stepfather a few days later. Shortly thereafter, the stepfather pulled the gun on Saltzman's mother again and threatened to shoot. Fearing for his mother's life, a few months later, when no one else was home, Saltzman entered his mother's and stepfather's bedroom and took his stepfather's gun. Saltzman's mother credits her son for saving her life, saying, As far as I'm concerned, I would be dead right now if he hadn't taken the gun. Saltzman sold the gun to a friend who used it in a burglary. Saltzman was convicted of armed burglary, since the gun he stole was used in it, theft of a firearm from his own home, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. Because it was within three years of Saltzman's release from prison for a burglary, that he committed when he was 16, he was given a mandatory sentence of life without parole under Florida's prison release reoffender law. Saltzman's mother, who was dumbfounded by the conviction, asks, How do you burglarize your own home? She also believes that if her son had shot his stepfather instead of taking the gun, he probably would be a free man under Florida's stand your ground laws. Even Saltzman's stepfather says that if it known his stepson would face a life sentence, he would never have reported the theft to the police. Number 4. Stealing a Slice of Pizza No one is arguing that swiping a slice of pizza from a group of kids, the charge faced by Jerry Dwayne Williams, isn't a jerk move, but is a life behind bars the appropriate punishment? Under California's Three Strikes Law, Williams, who maintains the children gave him the pizza, was sentenced to 25 years to life when he was convicted of felony petty theft for taking the slice of pizza in the summer of 1994. Williams had several previous drug and theft convictions and had served two years in prison for attempted robbery and for violating parole. However, after being released, Williams was working to turn his life around and had got an early release from his parole. When he returned to prison, Williams was known to his fellow inmates as Pizza Man and shared a cell with a convicted murderer, a convicted murderer who had a shorter sentence than Williams. When the California Supreme Court eventually ruled that judges could overlook previous convictions to spare a criminal life in prison under the Three Strikes Law, William asked the judge who sentenced him to reconsider. After serving more than five years, Williams was released. He says he is wary of returning to prison for any minor offense and notes that when he goes out for pizza with friends, I make sure people are around when I ask for it. Number 3. Stealing Fajitas To be clear, Gilberto Escamilla did not just steal a couple of fajitas. Instead, Escamilla, a former employee of the Texas Juvenile Justice Department, stole more than a million dollars worth of fajitas, which he had delivered to his employer and then resold over the course of nine years. Escamilla's scheme had been surprisingly easy to pull off. Authorities only caught up with Escamilla when he missed a day of work at the juvenile detention center. When the fajita delivery showed up, his surprised colleagues told the driver the facility didn't serve fajitas. In turn, the surprised delivery driver informs them that he had been dropping off regular fajita orders for almost a decade. Escamilla, who was 53 at the time of his 2018 sentencing, pled guilty and was sentenced to 50 years in prison, as well as a fine and restitution for the cost of the fajitas. The sentence was so heavy because Texas law treats thefts of more than $200,000 as a first-degree felony, allowing for sentences of up to 99 years in prison and additionally allows for more severe penalties for those who commit crimes while acting as a public servant. But as of 2019, he continues to face the prospect of dying in prison for stealing fajitas. Number 2. Murdering someone when he was one and a half years old We all know that toddlers can seem like criminals on occasion, but the Egyptian government took it to the next level when they sentenced a four-year-old boy to life in prison for murder. This was in connection with the 2014 riot. The boy was one of more than 100 people who were convicted in connection with the riot. If that wasn't ridiculous enough, the boy was actually only one and a half at the time of these supposed crimes, which included four murders. Lawyers for the boy's father reported that the court refused to consider the boy's birth certificate as evidence that he had been involved in the riots and that the boy's father reported that he had been taken into police custody when he refused to hand over his toddler to police. 
The Egyptian military eventually admitted that because of a mix-up with a similarly named 16-year-old, the boy's conviction was an error. The toddler and his father, who had been on the run since attempts by police to detain them both, returned to their home in southern Egypt after officials provided assurances that they wouldn't be arrested. Number 1. Insulting the King of Thailand on Facebook Thailand's Lays Majesty laws, codified in section 112 of the Thai Criminal Code, protect Thailand's royals from insults. The exact text of the law states, Whoever defames, insults, or threatens the king, the queen, the heir apparent, or the regent shall be punished with imprisonment of 3 to 15 years. The definition of what constitutes an insult or a threat is never specified, but Thai courts have applied a very broad standard when bringing charges. Cases have been brought against people for making sarcastic comments about the king's dog online, calling a dress a Thai princess designed for a Miss Universe contestant ugly, and scholarly questioning of the account of a battle in which the king of Thailand participated. A battle, by the way, which took place in the 16th century. The harshest sentence handed down for violating these laws, at least of early 2019, belongs to Vichai Thepwang, a former insurance salesman who was sentenced to 70 years in prison for 10 violations of these laws and 11 defamation offenses. What he had done was posted content that insulted the Thai royal family on a Facebook account that he created under someone else's name. Because he pled guilty to his crime, his sentence was cut in half to 35 years. His lawyer indicated that he was placing his hopes on the possibility of a royal pardon. Vichai said of his sentence, It's not beyond my expectations. It can't be worse than this. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. If you're looking for more from me, why not check out my other channel called Biographics, linked to below. And as always, I'll see you next time.